Hello. Hello. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. We're going to get, uh, get started here. Uh, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, our visiting artist. This is David Provan. I'm going to tell you some interesting things about him. Uh, he got his, uh, his BA from Yale University at, in 1997, or 1979, sorry, not that fucking long, but uh, his MA from the Royal College of Art in London, England in 1991. He's gotten some awards, including the Pollock Krasner Foundation grant in 1988, and the special award from the Goonla Beach Museum of Art in California in, uh, in, uh, in 84, and the Junior Henry Hopkins in 1984. Recent solo shows include Captured Spaces at the Lockwood Gallery in Kingston, New York in 2021, uh, pro uh, Proto Possibilities in cr uh, Cross con Contemporary Art in Saugatees, New York in 2018, Private Horizon Sculpture Installation at the Rye Center uh, in Rye, uh, New York in 2017, uh, Splendorla, Splendorla Sculpture Installation, yeah. uh, Metatawan, uh, gallery in Beacon, New York in 2017 as well. Recent solo shows include uh, Form, Height, Width, Depth, the Lockwood Gallery in Kingston, New York in 2020. Small Sculptures, Big Impact at the Strolls Art Center in Chautauqua Institution, New York in 2019. And Wilderstein Sculpture Biennium in Wilderstein Historic Site in, in uh, Rhinebeck, New York in 2019. Collections, it's very well collected. Uh, the Keyspan Collection in Brooklyn, New York. The Isles Art Foundation in Tokyo, Japan. Metropolitan Transpo uh, Transportation Authority in New York, New York. Yale University Art Gallery in New Haven, Connecticut. Uh, please welcome David Provan. Hi. One more thing, please silence your cell phones before we begin. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming. This is a nice, a nice turnout. Uh, so I've got a, a lot of images of artwork that I've done to, sh to show you, but I think the whole thing will make a little bit better sense if I tell you about my background, you know, how I got to, to, to where I am now, uh, and, and how and why. Um, so, well, I was uh, born in uh, Southern California, Los Angeles. Oh, that's nice. And, uh, my father was uh, an art student when I was born. He was uh, studying painting in Los Angeles. And uh, you know, it never occurred to me until I started putting this, uh, this lecture together, what it must have been like for my father, art student, like you know, many of you are and like I have been, having a baby in the midst of the whole thing. You know, I just thought that was you know, probably pretty intense for him. Anyway, they, they survived pretty well. Uh, so then, uh, we uh, moved to Northern California to Palo Alto, to uh, where Stanford University is, and uh, like the center of Silicon Valley now. And uh, I graduated from high school there, and uh, there's, a, there's a picture of me, uh, Southern California near San Diego, this is at my aunt's house, wearing actually her robe, in fact. Uh, I was maybe eight years old here. <clears throat> So we moved to, uh, to Palo Alto, like I said, I went to high school and uh, was, you know, I, I was like born into a family, you know, of artists, so it seemed to me that, you know, that's what everybody does, that's what I'm going to do when I grow up. And uh, so I probably would have, you know, if things were normal, I would have gone to college, studied painting, uh, et cetera, except... Uh, well, things aren't always normal, you know, so, but instead, this is where I ended up. The United States Navy. Uh, so, <clears throat> this is like the beginning of the, well, I was actually about the middle of the Vietnam War, and, uh, you know, my services were requested by the government. So, I flew for four years uh, as an uh, electronics uh, operator, uh, doing uh, reconnaissance missions in Southeast Asia. And uh, I don't know if you can pick me out there, but I'm up, my son picked it out the other day. Uh, back row, I'm the fourth from the right. And this is one of the planes that we flew in, an EC-121, which is like an old uh, TWA passenger plane that was 
you know, bought by the Navy and retrofitted and jam-packed with electronic gear. You know, you could, you could hardly walk down the aisle. There was so much electronics in there. But then again, this was pre, uh, I mean, this is the, the, the era of tube uh, electronics. So the, the equipment was like far bigger than it, than it is today. So uh, after four and a half years, I finally got discharged from the Navy. Um, I was stationed in Japan at the time. And I, I really loved living in Japan. I mean, the, the culture, the food, the you know, people, it was, it was really a great experience. Uh, but I was called into the personnel office and uh, the, the clerk said, uh, well, I see that you enlisted in Mountain View, California, so we'll arrange for transportation to, to send you back there. And then I said, kind of on a spur of the moment, I said, well, I don't know if I want to go back to the States right now. I kind of like Japan. I think I might stay here for a while. And you know, I'm thinking of maybe going to India, too. Uh, and well, I got interested in India because while I was in the Navy, I began reading about Buddhism and taking yoga classes. And uh, it's like my, my mentality was changing. You know, I was like a, a Navy guy, a sailor, but I was interested in other stuff. Um, and India is the country of origin for you know, both yoga and Buddhism. And I thought, well, maybe I should go there and check this out. Because for the first time in my 22 years, I'm not controlled by somebody else, my parents or the Navy. So I'm going to India. Uh, but I hadn't made any plans at all. So anyway, in the conversation with this uh, personnel clerk, you know, I told him I was thinking of going to India, even though I hadn't done anything in that direction. And so he. He pulled out a, like a calculator and he goes through and he goes, well, okay, tell you what, instead of sending you to California, we can send you to New Delhi, India. How about that? I go, ah, oh, okay, sure. So like right away, you know, it's my, I thought this, I was just gonna be signing some papers or something going in there, but my life changed, you know, at that point. It was like a complete, you know, pivot. So uh, I spent a few more months in Japan uh, I worked as a carpenter for a, a construction crew, uh, building houses around Tokyo and uh, Yokohama. And then at night, I worked in a, uh, a Suntory uh, whiskey uh, bar in Yokohama as a bartender. And uh, after about four months, then, then I took the government supplied flight to New Delhi. Um, let me see what. So because of my interest in uh, Buddhism, you know, I, well, I did all the tourist things. You know, I went to the Taj Mahal and New Delhi and Calcutta and all this stuff. But I also kind of gravitated towards, uh, you know, uh, monasteries and, you know, Buddhists that I happened to meet. And through uh, ref being referred and to, by different people, and I had a letter of recommendation, I finally met this man on the right here, Chachal Sangye Dorje, who was like one of the most revered uh, Tibetan Nyingma sect uh, Tibetan teachers. And so I, uh, I met him in Darjeeling and uh, you know, asked if he would teach me meditation. I mean, isn't that what you do when you're a Buddhist? You do meditation. And he said, uh, yeah, OK, sure. I've got a monastery in Nepal. Why don't you meet me there? And we can, we can do something. So uh, uh, I went there. Uh, he had a monastery just outside of Kathmandu, and uh, I remember the, the first meeting I had with him, I went into this, this shrine room, this very kind of ornate room, and he was sitting up on this platform like a, a dais, you know, it's like about as high as the stage. He was sitting there, you know, like almost enthroned, and I was sitting down on the ground on a pillow, and he sa said, uh, you know, there, there were other monks around and everything, and he said, you know, well, what do you do? Do you have a job or something? And I said, no, you know, I just gotten out of the Navy. Uh, you know, I'm traveling around I'm trying to learn about Buddhism, uh, but I like art. And he goes, oh, an artist, huh? Okay, so he reaches over and he gets a piece of paper and a pencil and he hands it to me and he says, draw me a Buddha. So I'm sitting there, with, he's watching me from his throne there and all these other monks and I, I draw this Buddha. I thought it was pretty good. I hand it to him and he goes, uh, yeah, okay. You know, it's like I, I failed the Buddha drawing test. Uh, but he did fortunately, you know, take me as a disciple. And uh, 
So, you know, I asked him you know, to teach me how to meditate. And so, uh, also the, uh, the monastery was, didn't really have room for me, you know, accommodations for me. So uh, he, they rented me a house, which is just, the, the monastery was actually right behind me when I took this photograph, but this is the house where I lived. And uh, like you can see, a spectacularly beautiful place. Um, uh, they, they must have like patterned the, the concept of Shangri-La off of this place. I mean, it was pretty amazing. The, the, uh, the accommodations were pretty raw, though. There's like no plumbing, no water, no uh, electricity. Uh, there, there was no glass in the windows. They were just shuttered holes in the wall. Uh, but I, I lived here for a year uh, doing meditations, mantra, prostrations, visualizations. Um, and I was, you know, I felt like I was finally my own person, you know, after having belonged to the, to the government, to my parents. Finally, I was here on the opposite side of the world, like trying to piece together a different kind of reality for myself. Uh, I was reading, I was reading Buddhist texts. I read the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the Bardo Todal. I read uh, J. Krishnamurti, Alan Watts, you know, people that try and help me uh, reboot my system, I guess, is what I was trying to do. Um, oh, one thing, what looks like, uh, maybe looks like a, a cloud bank there up on the horizon, those are actually the Himalayas. Uh, covered in snow, and uh, I think Everest is the second from the right, which looks, you know, kind of foreshortened. It looks a little smaller. You know, we know it's the biggest mountain in the world, but uh, these other mountains on the left are closer. So uh, well, one of the meditations I did was Dorje Sampa, and he's the deity of uh, purification. And he's here in like sexual embrace with his, uh, with his consort, you know, which is kind of risky, uh, uh, risque iconography. You know, if you've grown up Christian or, uh, you know, Jewish or something, I mean, this is a, a little over the top. But it's to symbolize the, the, the concept of yabyum, which are, is like the uh, collaboration of opposites, male-female principle, wisdom uh, and uh, compassion. Uh, this is one of my meditations. I, I did a, like a hundred syllable mantra, you know, accompanying a visualization of this. So, uh, and other cultures too uh, deal with that concept of, uh, you know, opposites in, in collaboration. Uh, like uh, the Chinese, the Taoist have uh, the, the yin yang uh, symbol, which is like a super elegant, minimal way of getting a really complicated thought across. You know, it's the, it, it's opposites competing, but they're collaborating at the same time. And on top of that, there's this uh, mutual dependence that you can't have the yin without the yang and vice versa. I mean, it, it's, it's part of the whole. So it's a, it's like a duality, but once it gets energized that becomes, you know, like the singularity. So was at the monastery for a year um, and was running out of money and running out of visas. You know, they, the immigration department was, you know, getting kind of annoyed with me asking for a tourist visa after a tourist visa after a tourist visa. And finally, you know, I just said, well, forget it. I got, it's time to continue on my, uh, my, my very slow trip around the world, you know, I was heading west. So I left the monastery and I took uh, public transportation, you know, like local buses and stuff all through the Mideast, got to Turkey, uh, then from Istanbul, I mean, this took months. Istanbul, I started hitchhiking and I hitched all around Europe, you know, France, Germany, Holland, uh, England, Scotland. I went to Scotland because that's where the, the Provan family comes from. Just thought I'd check in there. Uh, and then went back to America, back to California. Started school uh, on the GI Bill, you know, just like my father had done like 25 years, 26 years earlier. Uh, so, it, <clears throat> now, when I was a high school student, I was a 
You know, at, at best, I was a mediocre student. But uh, you know, once I got into college and I was my own man now, I wasn't, being, I wasn't a little kid being told you know, what my requirements were, what I had to take. You know, I could take painting, I could take sculpture, I could take astronomy. You know, it, was, it was fantastic. <clears throat> and I did much better in school anyway. And so I transferred to Yale, ma majoring in architecture and painting. Uh, and then to the Royal College, like, like Jared said, got an MA there, then spent a few months in Europe, went back to California with my new MFA, and I was going to be an artist. So, you know, I started, um, well, it might, another thing, my, my development as an artist through all, all my training was, um, you know, I did the standard stuff. I did, I was pretty good, you know, I, you know, was facile, I could, I could paint okay. I got A's in all my art classes. But I felt like I, it wasn't my language, you know. It took a long time to find out what I wanted to say and how I wanted to say it. So, um, working towards that, I found that the idea of yin-yang started coming back and that started showing up in my work. And so I was trying to, um, sort of meditate on that concept and then at the same time make a model of how I understood it was happening. Uh, not any kind of definitive, authoritative conclusion, I mean, because this thing goes around and around, right? There's no, it doesn't stop, it's not, it's not something you can easily pin down. So I started doing my interpretations of it and there are several series, and, and I want to go through them a series at a time. You know, I think it might be more interesting, more comprehensive for you, um, and, and you know, more interesting for me, for sure. <laughs> so the, the basic ground idea is polarity, the yin-yang. And so I did like a uh, model of, you know, a 3D model hanging on the wall with these two plexiglass, uh, you know, um, Discs, one hovering over the other. You know, I was thinking it was kind of like charged with psychic energy. Uh, you know, charged like the two poles of a battery or something. Um, I mean, it, some people might have actually hooked it up and made it electric with the little sparks between there. But I figured just the the indication of this that the viewer can do the rest because you can like feel the the pressure between those two plates. And this, incidentally, was like one of the very first welded steel sculptures I did. Um, it was before I ever set up my own uh, studio because, you know, I felt it was like prohibitively expensive to buy a welder and, you know, all the equipment that would go with it. So I took a, a course at uh, SVA, at the School of Visual Arts in, in Manhattan. So, you know, I pay my tuition, I walk in there and I had complete access to, you know, a, a, a metalworking studio. And this is one of the first pieces I did. And this is a much bigger one. And this is, this is really getting into the yab yum, you know, like the, the Dorje Sempa picture I showed you, you know, with the, the uh, Dorje Sempa and its consort together, kind of locked together in an embrace. And this is kind of locked in a similar way. Two identical boxes, one enclosed, made of wood covered with encaustic, and the other one is a metal welded frame. That, that has a, this protrusion that goes out of it and it curves around and it goes through a hole in the center of the, of the wooden box. And then another interpretation. Uh, well, one thing that I do too is that I follow the idea rather than what the work looks like. So you see, even though I'm going through with this polarity series, everything looks different. So, uh, and that's kind of the way I work. Uh, to, to my uh, sort of disadvantage in a way, uh, because galleries and museums like you to be identified, you know, have a brand, you know, something that can be identified, uh, you know, as your work. But with my stuff, it's like, it looks like the work of 50 different people. But that, I mean, I, I'm not complaining, mind you. <laughs> That's the way I do it. That's the way I roll. Uh, there's a couple of, uh, like, torqued triangles Opposites, one open wire frame, another one solid steel. Uh, a gouache drawing on handmade paper. The yin yang kind of dangling down there, but kind of looking like eyeballs hanging down. 
and then the, these tendrils that connect them, it starts to look like a, you know, a brain or something. You know, it's like thought, uh, or, or sight rather, and the, and the comprehension of it. Uh, another one, welded steel. Uh, this one's powder coated, which is a technique that I started using a few years ago, which is, you know, I don't know if you are familiar with it, but it's a, like a, an industrial coating, which is a, you, you spray on a, a dry powder, a pigment, uh, then you put it in an oven and you bake it on, the, the powder melts and you get this really good even, you know, drip-free surface. It's like, you know, they do it on uh, patio furniture and stuff. And then I hand painted the, the like the fluorescent uh, uh, yin yang symbols there. Another one. I also work in clay. This is uh, one I did two uh, uh, wheel thrown discs of concentric rings, uh, like each one its own kind of solar system. And then I cut them apart and put them together, so they're sort of beginning to merge there. Uh, a watercolor another interpretation of that, the polarity. Uh, next uh, series, Void in Form. Uh, I had always heard that material form contains a void, and, and my, I always thought, now what does that mean? You know, like material is, you know, that's, there's no void there. But then I started looking into it, and there's a couple of interpretations. Uh, one of them is the Buddhist interpretation in that form is empty because it is impermanent. Uh, we see it as, it appears to be like a, an autonomous thing, but it's actually in transition. You know, you're just seeing like a snapshot of it at this moment. It had a before, it'll have an after, it'll eventually disintegrate, so therefore, you know, they say it's void in form. On the other hand, like the, the left brain interpretation is the uh, nuclear scientists who tell us that atoms, you know, the basic building block of material, of everything, is uh, pretty much just an empty little capsule. I mean, it has like these subatomic particles in it, but they are so minute that they make up one millionth of one percent of the total volume of an atom. That's, I mean, that's kind of a hard thing to get a grip on with your mind. But, I mean, there are a lot of analogies for that emptiness. And note the paradox thing, that there's this huge emptiness in this tiny, tiny little particle. But one of the analogies is uh, if you were to enlarge an atom to the size of a football stadium, full football stadium, bleachers, everything, that's your atom. The particles in that would be the size of a peanut, right? So it's like so negligible, it's just about not there, you know? And so then I thought, well, how do you get material things uh, uh, made up of these particles that are, you know, like over 99% nothing? And I thought, you put a lot of nothings together, you get a something. But, uh, I mean, I, I understood up to that point, maybe like when I was in third grade, right? Um, but it was just a couple of years ago that it occurred to me that it doesn't work that way. The ratio never changes no matter how many atoms you have. So if you have like 99% empty atom, a single one, you put it together with trillions of other atoms to make a thing, that thing is still gonna be 99% empty space, right? I mean, everything. You, me, you know, the building. So, you know, it, it blew my mind. So I started to try, trying to make objects that conveyed that, that fact, uh, which I'll tell you right now is impossible to do. I mean, it, it's like ridiculous because you're, you're dealing with vast spaces and tiny particles and I'm working on the material human plane, and so it's got to be big enough that you can see it. And, but, you know, I did some spectacular failures, I think. So here's one, uh, void box number six. Uh, 
plywood box with the back and the top and bottom cut out so there's like air and light would go through it. And then I sort of defined that, you know, the, that uh, columnar void with a, a screen. And this has got like two doors that'll open and close. So it's sort of like a, a, like a shrine, like a shrine to the void. Then I tried another wave. I took a block of porcelain and I started carving into it, trying to introduce as much space into it as possible, but still retaining the rectangular of the, uh, you know, of the, of the block that I started out with. You know, if I went too far, the block would fall apart. If I didn't go far enough, it would look like a block with some little holes in it. So it was a matter of like achieving that balance between, you know, mass and emptiness. Then I did it in steel. This is powder coated also. Um, and, well, one thing I wanted to interject here. How am I doing here? Oh, not bad. Uh, that a lot of times I'll start, I'll have an idea for a sculpture, I'll start building it, I'll start working towards that goal, and then I get 50% of the way there, you know, 75%, and I go, whoa, hold it right there. That's it. You know, I've said everything I want to say. There's no point in, you know, elaborating on this. It's just like extra work. I got the idea down, good enough. And that's what happened here. I was starting to, I started with the tubes in the middle. They were the void holes. And then I was starting to fill in the sides with steel plate. And, uh, you know, I got five and a half sides filled in. And then finally I go, oh, that's good. Just like that, because I not only have the, the, the tubes, you know, representing the void, but I've got even the space between the tubes. So it was like a compounded void somehow. Uh, voidoid. Uh, you might notice I put, I put a lot of effort into titles. You know, I have a lot of fun with them. Um, I think they're like a special little data set that I can send to a viewer that accompanies the, the visual artwork. They're like, you know, a poem that accompanies the vision. Uh, and usually I make them up. Uh, this one I made up, I thought, Voidoid. And then I did a Google search, and there's, you know, a 1970s punk band called Voidoid. Darn, you know, but I still, I, I invented it, I think. So <laughs> I, I went with it. So this, this one, too, it's like, it's a very distinct shape, an object. But you can see into it. You can see right through it. So I was trying to, uh, you know, bring this kind of, uh, you know, champagne bubble equilibrium. And then I did kind of the same idea in in, uh, in stoneware, clay. Uh, threw a bunch of cylinders uh, out of clay. They dried a little bit. I massed them together and then carved this kind of ovoid shape. Uh, did this in, this is a hammered bronze, Sporadora, 2018. Uh, again, just, you know, sheets of bronze, hammer, hammered and with, with holes uh, riddled through it on a, a kind of a concrete base. Average atoms. Um, it's, this is bronze, too. It's uh, like a two-latticework uh, uh, grid that, uh, you know, are holding these, these cylinders. Uh, Daisy laser. This one's powder-coated. It's uh, this kind of a glossy lipstick red. You know, it's got this fun kind of a, like a toy feel to it, in a way. Daisy laser, uh, built tilt. This made uh, two by two uh, steel tube. This one's a little different than the the previous ones because the the void is inside the tubes, and I tried to like highlight that by leaving all the ends of the tubes open, and it's painted with a uh, like a matte cinnabar red, that, and it was in contrast to the saffron powder coated exterior. Uh, this is the one, the, the sort of the poster child here of this talk. Uh, we live within each other's wounds. It's one of my longer titles. But th this is bringing 
a lot of I different ideas together. You have the kind of the void circles, but then I'm also getting into this, this circulation idea, you know, and, and the way they're all connected uh, together. You know, these, these nodes of emptiness that are held together in this, uh, this matrix. And then this is another one that I started. I thought I was going to fill it all in with lots of steel rod, and I just got the barest suggestion of this shape. And I said, done. You know, go on to something else. That, that did it. And that, that's like one of the challenges is knowing when to stop. This is a more curvaceous void, the Venus of void. This is, uh, oh, Corten steel. Yeah, I should mention that too. That's another, that's my, my, my favorite material lately is uh, Corten steel, which is rusted like this. Uh, it's a special alloy of steel that has a, like a lot of copper in it. And it, uh, it's also called um, architectural steel. A lot of steel clad buildings use this. Uh, or weathering steel is another term. And um, it, it gets wet, it gets a coat of rust on it, and then that rust sort of seals the surface to inhibit any like further uh, deterioration. And you can, I'm, I'm learning to use like different chemicals and stuff to paint on this, and you can really like paint with the rust. I mean, like this one I was really happy about. I was getting the, like the, the runs coming down, the drips and stuff like down here. So that's like bringing, bringing my painting into the sculpture, painting with rust. Uh, this is another one. This is called the cloud sequence. I, I was, this is a, like a more of a formal kind of structure, you know, like very architectural. I was thinking of um, Japanese no theater, and they have a very specific kind of a stage. Let me jump ahead to it here. A specific kind of a stage with pillars put in certain places and there's this narrow ramp that runs up to the side and it's all this beautiful natural wood and that's, that's kind of what I was trying to go for here. <clears throat> and I wanted to show the, the sequence of like watching a, a cloud uh, dissipate, I guess. So it starts out on the left, there's just like a big void, just a hole in it. And the, the second third is the steel, rusted steel plate. And then the intermediate stage where it's sort of half, half there, half gone is the, the kind of checkerboard at the end. And then I did another, I like the idea of sequences, so I did a wave sequence. So I'm thinking both of like uh, electronic waves, you know, like sine waves and ocean waves and how a wave is a wave is not really a thing. You know, it's like a big body of water, but the water doesn't really move. It's the motion going through water. Uh, you know, it's, it's sort of a thing. Well, it's like a cloud, <laughs> like the previous one. The cloud, you look at it, you know, oh, that looks like a dragon. And then you watch it for a while, and the edges get a little bit feathery, and then you keep watching it, and then poof, it just, it's gone, you know? so. And the wave is like that, too. I mean, if that also falls on, I mean, rainbows fall in the same category. I mean, I, I get off on all these. I mean, everything is ephemeral. We're all ephemeral. But it's the things like rainbows and clouds that are more ephemeral. They're, they're dissipating quicker than we are. And, and therefore, it reminds us of our mortality, right? We don't notice our own mortality because takes a lifetime to go through it, right? But these other situations, they, they happen much quicker. A uh, life path. So then I started thinking about the, the polarity of life and death. Um, and so I tried to model that. I, I was making, uh, this is one of my first attempts from 1990, mortal trajectory. Uh, a big steel frame rusted for the most part, but then I try to imagine an individual trying to make their life choices and going through this, negotiating, navigating through it from one end to the other. And I picked that out in uh, gold leaf. 
And so it follows through and it comes to a junction and that's like a potential uh, decision for the individual. Do I go left? Do I go right? Do I go straight? Do I go to California? Do I go to India? Uh, so the, the goal runs from one end to the other through a, you know, a, a field of rust, kind of. Uh, time grinder. And this one I was saying is like birth and then the spiral down the pole and then death. You know, it's, it, it's as if the individual is coming out of the wall into this contraption, which is, you know, corporeal life, experiencing this kind of roller coaster ride and then back into the wall in death, you know, returning, returning from where the individual came from, you know. I mean, they say like death is exactly, what's it gonna be like when I'm dead? It's gonna be exactly like it was in 1821 for me, right? Same state. Uh, another version of it, uh, birth entrance up there, and it goes around, and the, the individual has all these little events, these little colored discs, you know, like, uh, you know, significant events, and then spewed out the other side there. Uh, another version, birth to death, another interpretation. Uh, the illusion of free will. Uh, like, you may think you're making choices, but maybe you're just following a predetermined path uh, through youth, middle age, old age, and with, the, with these big kind of embankments on the side to make sure you don't stray, you know. Or maybe, I mean, these are all speculations, right? I, I'm not saying anything is gospel. It's... Uh, uh, yeah, well, this is pretty tiny. I love seeing them blown up like this, but this is one of the smaller things I've shown. It's only about that big. Yeah. And this is unusual because it's a ceramic piece that I put on the wall, which is generally not done, or I generally don't do it. But, uh, I mean, most of these are on my website if you want to check into it, uh, with all the dimensions and media and everything. Uh, so that last series was birth to death, you know, a finite segment. This is the infinite version. This is the continuity that doesn't stop. Obviously not individuals because individuals die, but this is the, the life force continuing through generation after generation, through species after species. You know, there's, there's no stopping it, no beginning, no end. Uh, this one here, uh, Magellan Motion. This is a little, this maybe didn't belong in this series, but you know, bear with me. I mean, it does have this kind of circulation and rotation. Magellan was the, you know, the first navigator to go around the world, so I gave him, gave it his name. But um, in recent years, he's been discredited, I think. He did make it around the world, but he was not a very nice person. So, but that, the, the, the name stuck. And this is welded steel uh, with uh, an enamel finish, the, the kind of cream color that I scratched through to reveal the uh, steel underneath and then I put a black patina on it. So you get that nice like black cream contrast and then a clear coat over the whole thing. Uh, this is big Fandango maquette. This is about three feet high. This is a, like a big circulation um, in segments. So it's like the life force. I mean, uh, I don't know if there's a better term for that, but that, that's what I'm using today anyway. The, the circulation, but it's broken up into segments. So each segment could represent like a, a generation. Like a generation would go so far, it would terminate, the next generation goes on and it continues around. And this is uh, 12 feet high. This is uh, you know, related to the previous one. And this, uh, each section is powder coated and each section is separate. They, they all bolt together. Whereas the previous one was welded into one unit. 
uh, from forever to forever. Uh, this one, I think, is maybe the best representative of this series because it, it is one that, that flows very nicely. There's no, no clear starting or stopping point. Um, and the method for making it is uh, what you'd call noteworthy because when I started, I did, had no idea what it was going to look like. Um, I, I didn't do any drawings or measure anything. I just started making these arcs. And, you know, some long arcs, some short ones, some gradual arcs, some, you know, radical arcs. And then once I got like, you know, six or eight or ten of them, then I started welding them together. You know, again, it's like the continuous motion but broken into generational segments. And so, you know, it goes around and around, which is very easy and very fun to do, you know, it went very fast until I got to the last section. Then I had to like very carefully measure, you know, the angles of, of interface and the curves and everything. But that was nice to do. Then I did some drawings of the same idea. And this kind of relates to uh, some of the things that I showed earlier that where there are these like nodules that are connected by these things. Or I, I think of it you know, it's sort of like a, a oil refinery or something, like you have these big tanks with all these pipes connecting them. And another one. These are India ink on paper. Uh, and then I thought, I mean, I'd been doing this for like years, and I thought, continuous loop. Now, where have I heard that before? And then I thought, oh, yeah. In Tibetan iconography, there's this thing called the endless knot. So I thought, well, you know, I, I you know, I'm, I'm Buddhist qualified. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm related to the Tibetans. So let me use that. So then I, I took this, you know, carefully prescribed pattern, and you know, started like manipulating it and, and distorting it. And so I did this one here, which looks very much unlike the previous uh, picture, but I mean, if you look at it carefully, it does exactly the, the same over, weaving over, under, over, under, 180 degree turn, 180 degree turn, you know, in an, exactly the same pattern, but it's, you know, warped and morphed into a different kind of shape. Uh, this one's another, like a circulation one, pocket cosmos. It kind of reminded me of a, you know, like an astronomical diagram or something with stars and planets and stuff, but it, it's a little wacky. And it's got uh, the, the nodes to it are some of them closed, some of them open. So it's like that sort of a uh, you know, dichotomy there. And then perspective, oh boy. So perspective uh, blows my mind. Um, the, it's the, the idea of, you know, whoever it was that figured out how to take the three-dimensional world, figure out a little formula where they can flatten it out into a believable two-dimensional plane. You know, in other words, taking the world and drawing it or painting it. So I, I started doing this thing where, um, the, the, I mean, if you're familiar with what a, you know, the perspective diagram looks like, you have, you know, the horizon line, and then you have the vanishing points where the, the, the lines converge. The four verticals are the four verticals of a, like a hypothetical a cube in space, and then the, the way the cube tapers away, you know, that the vanishing points determine the angles. So <clears throat> to draw attention to this transition, I made these sculptures that are halfway there. You know, it's like stuck between 2D and 3D. It's like 2.5D. It's a sculpture of a drawing. And the drawing is the device that you interpret the three-dimensional world with. So it gets kind of convoluted. And uh, I mean, it's ridiculous, but the ridiculousness points out to the importance of it if that makes sense. Uh, I started doing things, you know, a little bit optical illusion things. <clears throat> I got a trapezoid at the bottom, a trapezoid at the top. The difference is the one on the bottom is 
actually a trapezoid. It's flat against the wall. The one on the top is actually a square that's tilted in just the right angle. So the viewer looks at it, and it looks pretty much like the, the, uh, the drawing of it on the bottom. So a real square and a fake one. And I did it with circles, a real ellipse, a real circle that's tilted just right so it looks like an ellipse. So it's like two dimensions blooming into three dimensions. <clears throat> Healy orbit. And this one I could spend the rest of the night talking about, but I'm, <laughs> I'll cut it really short. Uh, I was thinking of the, the Ptolemaic version of the solar system, which is geocentric. The Earth is in the center. Everything rotates around us because we're so important, right? You know, we're God's children. Then there's the Copernican version, which says, uh-uh, not quite right. The sun's in the center. We're just merely the Earth in secondary position. We're rotating around that. And then, you know, my hypothesis that takes it a step further is that there is no center. Nobody's in the center. Everything is in motion. The sun, the earth, the whole works. Uh, this is like falling inside yourself. I did this 92, a long time ago. I, I wanted to, it, in my playing around with perspective, I wanted to take a perspective model and turn it inside out. I wanted to make what is the closest to the viewer is actually the furthest, and the furthest is actually the closest. So there's a, in two elements here bolted to the wall. Th this is the, the thing you look at, and the one over there is the viewer through which you look to this one. So you start to move around to the right, and you see it like this. You see there's kind of a distorted checkerboard on the bottom of the left-hand one. And then you just take another step, and then you look through that hole, and you see this thing that kind of appears like you're looking down a, a hallway that has columns down the side and this checkerboard floor. But if you recall going back here, it's just the opposite of what it is. And I thought I could take it another, another step and make it like really look uh, Believable, you know, like put capitals on the columns, you know, make a wall with a door at the end of the hall. And I said, ah, eh, I got the idea across, good enough. Go on to something else. So this is another one of the perspective diagrams. 3D VP. And again, all the convergences are vanishing points. The horizontal bar is the horizon. And there's, I think there are like four different cubes defined in there somewhere on both sides of the horizon. Another thing, too, the, a lot of these, what I claim that I'm trying to describe, somehow it doesn't work. You know, like I'm trying to use a big object to describe an atom or something. You know, it doesn't work. But it, in its uh, process, it makes a failure that is pretty satisfying anyway. And it makes it, in, it generates an interesting object. Uh, this is another version, horizontal bars, the horizon line. And this one, I, I go all out. This is like an encyclopedia of perspective because I have one-point perspective models on the two ends. The green, blue, and yellow one are two-point perspective, and the red one is three-point perspective with a third perspective point up in the, up in the air there. And this is like you know a couple of feet tall. But this is the big version. This is like seven, seven and a half feet high, I think. And this one, too, because it was so big, um, it wouldn't fit into the powder coater's oven. So I had to make each section separately. And then I, you, I think you can see all the bolts in here. I had to bolt it all together in the end. Uh, that's how big it is. And then I did a bunch of drawings working with, uh, in German, it's Fluchtpunkt, which is vanishing point, you know, like one point perspective. 
So I draw a horizon line, I do a single vanishing point, and then I have this array of stuff that is all pointing towards that one vanishing point. And it, you know, the, the, and the one that's at your eye level is the only one you can see through. All the rest, because they're turned at angles, they're all occluded, you know, they're all blocked. This is uh, watercolor and ink here. Um, this one, I saw some shelves, like a whole series of shelves. And I noticed that the one, the ones that were right at eye level, I could see right through. But you know, as you look up and look down, they 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 start blocking one another, and it becomes darker and darker. Diagram of the before and after. And this one is, you know, you have the upper dark and the lower light and the, the light, kind of the fins going through the dark and the dark going through, rotating through the light. This is India ink, the source of now. And more floating cylinders. And figure ground. Now, figure ground is the one series where, just because of the nature of it, there's no sculpture involved. It's all painting and drawing. And there's sort of the example. I didn't paint this, by the way. Uh, so we got the figure, we got the Mona Lisa, and we got the ground, which is the northern Italian landscape back behind her. And Figure ground is like a concern for, of painters because you want to have the figure distinguished from the background, but not too much because otherwise it's going to like pop off the surface. So you have to kind of gauge that, you know, so the light is right. Um, so they work together, but separately at the same time. Um, and then also I look at it in, from a cosmological standpoint and that I see the, the ground is the result of the Big Bang. You know, it's like it's throwing out energy and uh, matter uh, in uh, just like a, uh, like a sheet, like a, like a well, the, the ground. I mean, this is the debris of the Big Bang, right? I mean, we're all it, right? We're the Provided you believe in the, <laughs> the Big Bang, that's another question. But let's assume that it's true, and all this matter that went shooting out began to congeal into things, into planets, into stars, and, and those started to congeal into mountains and trees and oceans, and you know, reptiles and dinosaurs and rodents and uh, you know, humans and everything else. Uh, but it doesn't stop there. It, then all those things, all those composite things, are destined to come apart. So the, all those atoms break free from their temporary identity. They disperse, and that dispersal itself will reconjoin and become another series of stars, planets, trees, etc. It's, it's a cycle we're, we're in the flow of it. And we don't notice it because our lives are so brief. You know, it, it seems like all this stuff is permanent, but actually everything is in motion. So Mona Lisa, uh, it's obvious here, e even in um, like abstract painting, like to take a, a Mark Rothko painting, for instance. If you look at the, the, like these big squares of glowing color that he has, in almost all of his paintings, he'll have a little tiny fuzzy border around. That's the background. That's, that's what anchors the subject of the glowing squares. Um, and that, that sets up that figure ground dynamic. And I mean, it's very obvious in, in this one here. So I tried to break it down, be real simple. You know, I did this simple checkerboard background and then these two kidney-shaped entities floating above it, you know, one of them magnifying the pattern and one of it reducing it. They're both of the background, but they're their own things. They're, they're like their, uh, their own identities. 
And this one, kind of like a starburst background that's captured by this six-limbed object, but it's also reflecting uh, the background. Another one in indigo ink, as if forever. And this, this one is one of the simpler ones, but one of my favorite ones because it's, well, because it's so simple. You know, there's like the radiating, uh, you know, the Godhead or the Big Bang or whatever you want to call it that, that fills the whole frame. And yet this oval shaped thing has kind of borrowed from that energy and become its own, its own person. The sublime, etc. This is a uh, watercolor and ink. And then uh, we are we <laughs> round one. Well, it, it's coming to the end here. Uh, and then this one. It's always exciting when like my different distinct series will merge or cross. And, and you see it happening here that the other one where I had the, uh, the continuity one where I had the Tibetan uh, endless knot, it found its way into the, the, uh, the uh, form and, uh, and background series. So, I mean, you can pick out just the arrangement of these circles. You see it also goes in here and it's like looping and weaving through itself and turning around. Uh, another one, this is acrylic uh, on board. Um, I think it's like 30 something by 24. And with a Tibetan knot woven into that background. Another one, this is enamel on masonite. Temporary eternity. And then uh, one change that I made in that is that I, I started like zooming in on the Tibetan knot and, and the, the background. So this is just a, a segment of the Tibetan knot. You know, it's not, it's much less formal and kind of like bolder shapes. This is a acrylic on canvas and I think it's 36 by 36 or maybe 40 by 40. Coil joy, you know, another entity arising out of a background. That's watercolor. Uh, Yabyum, this, and so that's sort of the bulk of the work. Yabyum is a public art commission that I did for the New York MTA a few years ago. This is a, the model that I made my proposal with. Um, down in here is the subway train, uh, and then these big paddles that are powered by the wind that's like push the head of the subway trains as they come into the station. Uh, so they, they turn around. Uh, that's building it in the studio. You can tell by the color of my hair, this is several years ago. Uh, oh, there are 14 of these uh, paddles here. That's just one. And this is the installation. It's at uh, Herald, Herald Square Station in Manhattan. And like, well, like I said, there's just a fraction of it. Uh, it. There's 14 of them, and it's like 200 feet long. This was one of the uh, first commissions that the New York MTA did. And uh, it, it was a mistake. I mean, we shouldn't have put this in that position because it's, um, it's a kinetic piece and it's directly over the subway train. And this subway, this is the Uptown F train, runs right under there, which is sort of like one of the life lifelines of Manhattan. I mean, it carries, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of people every day. But to install this, we had to stop the trains. We had like, uh, you know, flagmen out on the tracks. They stopped all these commuters, said, hold it, right there, we're gonna put up an art installation. So we put these up, but once it got up, then we thought, well, this is never gonna be maintained, and it has not been. It's still up, but it's like 
coated in dirt, and it still turns around a bit. Surprisingly, it's never been lubricated. You know, this, these uh, axles here should have been lubricated like probably once a year. That's what I stipulated in the contract. Never been touched, but uh, you, you learn from your mistakes. There's the F train down there and some of the wind paddles up there. Uh, furniture, I thought I'd run through that quickly. I got just a couple things. I had a furniture business uh, a few years ago. I designed and built furniture. I showed it at trade shows. I showed it in magazines and stuff. Uh, this is all welded steel, payment chair, 1994. Stainless steel back and seats and then uh, patinated legs and back. Nested chair. Um, eight upholstered pads that sort of suspend you on eight points. And with this one, uh, another, well, one of these nested chairs that I made um, was uh, bought by a prop company in Hollywood, and it's, it showed up uh, like on a couple of TV programs, which is sort of amusing. The Basho coffee table, these two suspended boxes under a glass uh, tabletop, and the, the boxes are open on the other side, so you can you know, put your uh, TV remotes and stuff in there. The palanquin cabinet, the black part is welded steel, and like a, a palanquin chair, I guess is what they're called, uh, you know, you, like you see them in old Kurosawa movies and stuff, like the There'll be like two guys in the front holding two poles and two in the back holding two poles. And then there'll be the princess in a little box in the middle. You know, she's suspended. And that's kind of the way the, the cabinet, the wooden cabinet's being carried uh, within the steel framework. Uh, and I know this is the one that I put for the last, so that's the end. <laughs> this is a gold lamp. It's all gold leaf. There's a light bulb in the vertical part that bounces light off the, that kind of parabolic curve there. Oh, so, uh, uh, any questions? Well, great, I, I answered them all, I guess, in the, in the course of my talk. Oh, okay, all right. So, um, what made you want to start making like more like functional art, I guess, with like the furniture stuff? Um, well, that's a topic. Good question. Uh, well, I'd always been interested in furniture. Uh, I was in, uh, represented by two galleries at the time, one in New York, one in Chicago. Both of them closed about the same time. Uh, I was curated into a show in Korea, and some of the work got damaged. Uh, it ended up getting stuck in Chicago, and um, I had to pay a lot of money to get it shipped back to me in New York. My art career, I was getting really tired of. You know, I was, I was getting pretty frustrated. You know, my, my allies, my galleries were disappearing, and I was having all these other problems, and I thought, you know, I, I studied architecture and design and I can do furniture. So, you know, I had this whole metalworking studio. Let me make metal furniture. And I started doing it and started showing it like I showed it at the Jacob Javits Center uh, in, in Manhattan. And it got a great response. You know, I got, I was in magazines and newspapers, you know, like all around the world. I was in Italian design magazines. You know, it was really ex exhilarating compared to the, you know, I felt like the uphill battle in the art world, you know, trying to get recognition and get into a gallery. And it was like a breath of fresh air to do furniture. But that was the beginning. And then the end of it <laughs> is when I found that I would design something. I thought it was really cool. It was fun. Uh, I'd sell a few of them. And then people would come to me and say, hey, that's great. Can you make me 20 of them? And I go, oh. Yeah, I guess so, okay. You know, it's like I became a factory worker then. I was just like reproducing my own designs. I, I'd much rather design a new chair every time rather than just do the same one made 
personally by me by hand, you know, over and over. So at that point, I said, well, I'm, I'm going to go for the art, forget the furniture. I mean, the art, you know, the sculpture, what I really want to do. And the, the furniture was just sort of a temporary uh, thing. I mean, I still make furniture, you know, for myself, but I don't, I don't promote it or anything. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, too. <laughs> so one more question. Uh, someone's waiting for the room here, so uh, one more. Do you still travel around, and where have you kind of called home? Um, well, I live in New York State, uh, and we do travel. You know, I'm, I'm married, I have two kids, and we travel you know, a pretty good amount. I mean, my kids have been like all around the world. I, I mean, we do. I, mean, I don't go for five years at a time like I did before. You know, we go for a month here or a month there. But yeah, we, we all like to travel. Thank you. Yeah, I guess I think I'm going horse, but. <laughs> That's how you know, right? Uh, that, was, that was amazing. Yeah, really? Okay. Yeah, thanks for coming. Uh, super inspiring. Uh -huh.